started. Sounds good. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mia Keys, and I serve as the Chief of Staff to Congresswoman Robin Kelly. And I just want to thank you all for joining us for this uh, significant event. We're wrapping up the fifth annual Black Maternal Health Week. And for those of you who have been following maternal health for so long, it, it, on the congressional level, you know the significance of this week and, and how, how far we've come to, to come to this space. We're looking forward today to talking about Black maternal health policy specifically. And then we're also going to be, um, be talking with the, with, with the champion, the godmother of maternal health in Congress, Congresswoman Robin Kelly, my boss, who I'm very honored to, to help uplift her work here. She's, um, she is hosting this event and she's invited the Black Women's Congressional Alliance to be a part of this discussion. And you'll hear from those members uh, later on in this discussion. And Congresswoman, I know that you've been the champion in the space since you came into Congress almost 10 years ago. And I'm really looking forward to having everyone know more about that work and what it's taken behind the scenes. And um, we look forward to you being able to tell us about that. We're also joined today by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Administrator, uh, Ms. Brooks LaShore. And so Administrator LaShore has, uh, Brooks LaShore has joined us. And thank you so very much for joining us, Administrator Brooks LaShore. You've had quite the busy week um, talking about what you're doing, what the Biden-Harris administration is doing, and what everyone collectively is doing to build a more equitable future with respect to the health of Black women. So we're very much looking forward to hearing from you. And in fact, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Congresswoman Kelly, um, and, and also then over to you, Administrator Brooks LaShore, for your opening remarks. And then we'll get started. Thank you, Mia, and thank you, Administrator Brooks LaShore, for making time to join me today. As Mia said, we know you've been busy. <laughs> Mia, as you've mentioned, I've been working on maternal health policy for a long time now. But actually, before I came to Congress, I didn't even know that it was an issue in the United States of America. We probably all know someone who has experienced issues with maternal health, but what I did not know is that the United States has one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the developed world, and that black women are three to four times more likely to die than other women. After working on this issue for so long, I've come to learn the stats backwards and forwards. And I know many in our audience know these stats too. So I wanna focus on what comes next. What Administrator Brooks LaShore and I are working on now to make sure that we turn this crisis around and that every black woman in America can have a safe and healthy pregnancy and delivery if she so chooses. Last month, President Biden signed my bill, the Maternal Health Quality Improvement Act into law and part of the FY22 appropriations packet. I was so proud to see this bill go through as it makes up a large chunk of my Mama's Act, which I first introduced way back, it seems like in the 115th Congress. Now I'm working to get the rest of the Mama's Act passed, which includes a really critical policy, mandatory postpartum Medicaid coverage for one full year in every single state. I got a five-year option for states included in the American Rescue Plan, but we need to make sure that this becomes permanent and mandatory so that every woman in every state has access to life-saving care they need after having a baby. One third of all maternal deaths happen up to a year after giving birth. So this absolutely must get done. I'm also working to close the Medicaid coverage gap to address social determinants of health increase culturally informed care and eliminate biases. For now, I will leave it at that so that we can get into our discussion and questions. I'll turn it back to you, Mia. Thank you, Congresswoman. And you've been so very modest in terms of um, all this work. And I, I, I think you should also let the people know you are a mother, you are a grandmother, and you are a mother to so many other adopted uh, persons. And we are grateful for the work that you're doing for um, to impact the generations. Administrator Brooks LaShore, tell us a bit about the work that you've been doing through CMS and what we can look forward to in terms of working with the Biden-Harris administration. Thank you, Mia. I'm first going to um, uh, ditto your kind and comments about Congresswoman Robin Kelly and just what a champion she is for maternal health. And from the first moment I got to meet her at CMS, 
administrator, I was really blown with her warmth and her passion around this topic. And in one of my happiest moments as CMS administrator, we were with the vice president, um, really in as a call to action at the vice president at the at the White House. And we were on a panel together with um, other members of Congress who are who are champions, as well as people with lived experience. And after that panel, the next day, I was on with stakeholders who were so moved at such a profound level at the fact that at the White House, there was this a discussion about maternal health, that the vice president's leadership was bringing voice to some really unspoken unspoken pain. And I really want to thank Congresswoman Kelly for her, her, her ongoing passion in this space, because the one month postpartum coverage that is right now optional, that she continues to push it to be mandatory, I truly believe is one of the single most important things we can do as a nation. Um, and I and some of that perspective comes from me being a mother and what it was like two months after, three months after. I remember um, we lived abroad at the time and I came back and I was just sharing this with my doctor of, you know, I didn't have a babysitter when we came back from Australia, but I went to see my own OBGYN and there I was trying to get my checkup and I had a child my little girl in my arms is crying. I was just like, what if I have, like trying to get checkups when you're going through all of this stuff and to actually have to try to change your health insurance in the midst of all of that, when you're just trying to keep it together, we have so much work to do. And I'm really excited about this, uh, this incredible per provision. Um, and 12 states are working with us right now um, to uh, put this into law, we have um, five states who are um, are moving ahead, but we we plan to keep going one by one until we get all of the states in, whether um, voluntary or mandatory. We're we're headed for for that uh, for that number. So that's one of the biggest things that we are focused on. Um, the second thing that we have talked about uh, and and just released uh, um, in the last couple of days is this notion of, of letting um, family members uh, and mothers-to-be know which hospitals have the designation birthing friendly. And we're starting with a measure that really focuses on whether the hospital has engaged in a collaborative um, to, to really try to improve maternal health outcomes. And we will continue to push um, to increase the, the measures that we were looking at as we evaluate the facilities that are under our um, are under our space and jurisdiction. I also, um, as uh, as we've talked about, just there's so much action um, in uh, starting from the president, um, but really spearheaded by the vice president within the administration. And last week, I was privileged to join the maternal health cabinet. And if I can tell you that the energy in the room and just the idea, I mean, you have EPA talking about the effect of the environment on mothers. You have the Labor Department looking at their authorities. You have the military, DOD, who is sitting there, and we are all working together to try to figure out how can we work together and support each other. Um, and then, of course, HHS. So at HRSA, Ms. HRSA has maternal health grants, we have Medicaid, and we are really engaging um, at the department level of trying to think how we can work together. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention and then let you um, get to leading us in questions is that we have learned a lot um, in looking at the data. The Office of Minority Health and our Medicaid office partnered together over the last couple of months to really look at our Medicaid data um, and try to find out what, what we can learn from what's going on with maternal health. We've been sharing that with, um, through technical assistance with states, and we are gonna open that up even broader uh, um, in the, during the summer where we'll have a stakeholder discussion and really bring together private industry to put commitments on the table to advancing um, maternal health. That's, so that's another thing that we are, um, we are actively engaged in. So as you can see, there's a lot happening um, that we're excited about, uh, but happy to answer and take the conversation in whatever direction you want to go. Thank you so very much for that opening, Administrator Brooks LaShore. The other thing I'll say about you and your work is that, um, and for those of you who are not familiar with CMS and what they cover, first and foremost, they cover, of course, 
Medicare, Medicaid, but also CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program. And also it's up to CMS to regulate the healthcare.gov insurance, um, health insurance marketplace, right? But but with you and your past work, Administrator Brooks LeShore, you worked on the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, the AMA. Um, and had it not been for, for the AMA to begin with, we'd still be having a conversation about women and the, the uh, gender specific conversation around what it takes to birth a child and all of that. I'm wondering, before we go into the questions, if you could just briefly talk about that as well, because that's important to this maternal health conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, health insurance is just so key to um, being able to uh, live your best life. And before the Affordable Care Act, which is not that long ago, but, you know, one of the biggest issues that we had as a country is that even if you could afford it, sometimes you could not get coverage because of your pre-existing condition. And women paid more than men because women have health care needs. Um, but just by virtue of being a woman, 15 years ago, you would be charged a different rate than a man your same age uh, to buy health insurance. And so it really was starting with creating um, a floor of saying uh, that coverage should not um, vary in cost based on your pre-existing condition, i.e. what gender you are um, and what your health status is, et cetera. Just so important um, as a fundamental, because it's not just when you're pregnant when, that your health matters. It matters all the years leading up to it, how you're, you know, whether you're getting regular checkups, whether your diabetes is treated, and um, whether you have things going on in your health that you have no idea about. Um, and, and that's one of, among other things, one of the reasons why we do see differences in maternal health outcomes, because of the, when women are pregnant, they're in a different health, um, uh, health status than, um, than others. Thank you so very much for that. I, I know I put you on the spot. But you talked about building the floor. Congresswoman Kelly, you're taking us to, to blow out the ceiling. So tell us more about the fact that, you know, President Biden just signed your Maternal Health Quality Improvement Act into law. You mentioned that already. Can you tell us more about that legislation and how that's going to improve maternal health? You're on, you're on uh, mute there, Congresswoman. You should know by now. <laughs> Uh, first, it authorizes a grant program to improve maternal health outcomes by developing evidence-based best practices, improving maternal mortality review committee data, and evaluating new models of care. Uh, secondly, it authorizes a grant program to address implicit and explicit bias training for healthcare providers. It also creates a study to develop recommendations for teaching within uh, health professional training programs to reduce and prevent biases that could impact maternal care. Lastly, uh, authorizes a grant program for developing integrated healthcare services for pregnant and postpartum women and infants with grants and reporting of study outcomes. There's a lot around um, uh, biases that people have, but we know that's one of the, uh, the really big problems. And I know that's not all you're doing, Congresswoman. We're gonna we're gonna um, have you talking about um, more about what you're doing in Congress in just a few minutes. Um, Administrator Bruce Lashore, if you can tell us a bit more about your your conversation, your conversations with Vice President Harris. You talked about it a little bit. Um, what went on at the first Maternal Health Day of Action in December, and, and how did you leave that conversation? What did you pick up were the most urgent aspects of that crisis of this crisis from that conversation? So. The vice president is serious about this as an issue and really uh, it was a real engagement of what is every agency and department doing, what are her priorities. And, and part of what I think was so meaningful is really to hear that across the government, there are real robust um, efforts underway uh, and that we can learn from each other. So really hearing um, what uh, what everyone is up to, I think, fosters conversation. Most of our conversation is really around what can, you know, a lot of my focus is what can we do at CMS. And a big part of that is, are, are some of the things I talked about, but I would say that a lot of the language that I use is we 
as we think about health equity in general at CMS, and then maternal health in, in particular, is really trying to use every lever we have. So like this um, birthing friendly designation, is really a Medicare issue. It's, um, but we're, Medicare doesn't pay for that many births, but we're gonna use every lever that we can um, in terms of uh, making sure that we are uh, uh, pulling out all the stops to try try to address this issue um, and really working across the department. And I would say that one of the things is at the state level, one of the things I'm most concerned about and focused on is at the state level, a lot of times there isn't the level of coordination that we want to see. And one key area is um, something that the vice president cares very deeply about, and that is doulas. And so um, one of the things that we are working on is how do we incorporate doulas into the Medicaid program? And part of that, I think, is really going to come from coordinating with the maternal health grants that also are, um, you know, at the other side of the house with HRSA, of really trying to make sure that care is integrated, as well as, of course, um, looking at the Medicaid program. But a lot of it is about making sure that we are seeing um, women as whole people um, and not just the, not in just this isolated issue. Uh, there, there are many things we need to tackle, um, but a key core of it is making sure we're not we're not just thinking about the birth itself, because a lot of, um, a third of the deaths are a week to a year afterwards. And so we're really, really trying to focus. Yes, there's some things at the um, at the delivery itself that we need to be addressing, but there's so much leading up to it and leading after it that is, um, that, uh, that, that's really affecting our, our outcome. And of course we care about it from the, the mother's perspective, but the flip side is just as important. And you mentioned Chip, the children. Um, and so just the impact of um, these difficult births uh, or co or morbidities affects the child's health as well. Um, and so really just trying to make sure we are really, really thinking about all aspects uh, from that perspective. And I am clapping it up in the inside um, for doulas in particular. I'm, I'm, I just gave birth four months ago, and so I'm a new mom. My, actually, I just noticed my pumping bottles are here in the back. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> but uh, I, I, to your point about doulas, I, I ha had two. I had a, a labor and delivery doula who was also my prenatal doula and a postpartum doula. And had it not been for my doulas, there could have been some things that, that were missed. But um, more than anything, I just felt very supported and surrounded mm -hmm. um, as, as I was becoming a mother. And um, now that I'm a new mother, I'm still in touch with my, actually, my doula just stopped at my house yesterday to the say hello. So nice. Let's keep up the work and keep supporting moms. Congresswoman, speaking of which, you know, with, with the maternal, excuse me, the Maternal Health Quality Improvement um, Act, you know, like I mentioned, that's just a start. What's next for maternal health policy in Congress? And, and what policies do we need to pass now? And, and, and why, why is that? Sure. Well, first of all, we need to keep the pressure on. We just, you know, we can't rest on our laurels. We have to keep on moving because unfortunately moms are still dying. So we need to need to need to close a Medicaid coverage gap. We have planned to do that as you know and build back better, but now we must find another route. And the same thing for permanently extending postpartum Medicaid coverage for one year. Again, that was included in a bill back better, but we're looking for other opportunities to move it forward independently. Uh, you know, maybe, um, you know, those in the Senate will, um, you know, um, uh, cast a, a smile or something over these particular pieces and we can get them not only passed in the House, we know we can do that, but pass in the Senate also. And then also we simply need to continue working to address health equity and social determinants of health more broadly. That's, you know, a big part of this. And next week, as you know, we'll be introducing the Health Equity and Accountability Act, which focuses on so many, you know, of these issues because, you know, we still suffer, you know, as the administrator said, from access and you know, um, different things like that, resources. So we need to do everything that we can do to, um, you know, get us out of the place that the United States is in uh, with the rest of the world. 
compared to the rest of the world, I should say. We, we, we should be ashamed. We, we, we need to yeah. do much better. We sure do. We really do. And that's why you're, you're here. Uh, Administrator Brooks on the shore, tell us a bit more about what you were talking about earlier, the new birthing friendly hospitals and the designation guidelines for that. Yeah, so um, I, we've announced it and I think maybe going live in like 10 minutes, <laughs> our, uh, our rule coming out. Um, so as part of um, our process uh, at CMS, we uh, issue regulations and what we're doing here in the birthing friendly initiative is saying we're starting with a measure of of looking to see are you as a hospital um, uh, again engaged in in collaborative so really trying to make sure that the hospitals are um, really focused on best practices and and we know a lot we know a lot about um, what is working and what is not and we want to make sure all of the facilities that are um, delivering babies know what those best practices are. So this is a step and we plan though over time to increase the measures that, that we're looking um, to. And so as part of the process, we encourage people to take a look at uh, the regulation um, and certainly add uh, additional thoughts and comments. Um, and, and sort of our process is updating the um, measures that we have on a yearly basis. And so we're starting with this one that we have data for, um, but really plan to continue to build on making sure that facilities are uh, meeting the standards um, that we want them to meet. I wanna keep, give this next question and um, this is my close out this portion. Um, I wanna give this to the both of you. You know, and this is a heavy topic and we rightfully so focus on the loss um, uh, associated with maternal health, um, particularly when you're talking about black women and brown women in the US. What about this conversation and this time excites you, you know, with respect to maternal health and maternal health policy or, or what makes you hopeful about what's to come? And um, uh, Administrator Brooks LaShore, I will start with you with that question and ask the Congresswoman to round us out. Well, you know, you asked me about the Affordable Care Act, and I've been thinking just how similar I think this time is. So um, I, as people will recall, sometimes you don't remember, but when we started doing the Affordable Care Act, there were a lot of people who were wondering why we were trying to tackle health care. We were in the middle of what we now call the Great Recession, and we didn't know what was going to happen with the economy. And there was sort of a push-pull of why are we spending our limited political capital on health? And the reason was because health was actually, in part, was affecting the crisis. At the time, families were going bankrupt and it, because of medical costs. And a significant number of those bankruptcies at the time I remember hearing that it was a third were caused by medical costs. And I actually think we're in a similar moment right now where COVID-19 has just exposed in a different way our inequities. We know that they existed, that they were not new, but I think there is a different level of awareness and a willingness to talk about these issues right now. It's a limited window, but we need to seize this moment but I mean, nobody comes in to talk to me without saying health equity because they know we care about it. And the industry knows that there is something here. And so I think I am hopeful because I think we have this window to seize and say, look as a country, look at the price we're paying. Congresswoman Kelly said it just right. It's an embarrassment. We should be ashamed at these results. They're ridiculous. And we can say that very boldly right now and nobody can disagree. And I, and so that is why I'm hopeful because there is energy, there is voice, and, I, and you have some senior leaders who are absolutely devoted to making sure that we move the needle on this. And that's why I'm hopeful. Congresswoman, words to add? Sure, first of all, the idea that we're talking about it, as I said, when we opened, I didn't even know it was an issue until someone tapped my shoulder when I was in Congress that this was an issue, but 
a, a certain family that had a loss couldn't really get the attention. So that's one thing, you know, that we're talking about it and others are talking about it. And my other hope is that um, women, women or it could be young women or, you know, whatever age you are, that you are more aware as you go into your doctors, you go into the hospitals, what your rights are, uh, what you should be asking for, how things really should happen. And we just don't go along with the program that we make sure that we're treated, you know, with respect and good care, quality care, like everybody else. Also, I'm excited about, you know, Administrator Brooks LaShore announcement about birthing friendly hospital designations and guidelines. I think that is really cool and a great, great idea. And we deserve to know what kind of healthcare facility, you know, we're walking into. I, it reminds me of New York with the restaurants, A's and B's and hopefully not C's, you know, and you have a choice about uh, which, which restaurant uh, that you're eating in. And finally, what is absolutely fantastic is that we have an, a supportive administration through President Biden, through Vice President Harris to get things done. They realize the urgency of the situation because again, you know, uh, mamas can't wait. You know, I, I, I still have uh, three childbearing daughters and, it, you know, it, it, it makes me nervous. Two of them have had, one has not, you know, and uh, it, it makes me nervous to think about what could or could not happen. So, uh, but I'm I'm hopeful. I am definitely hopeful. I'm certainly holding on to that hope, and and with the hope we work. So, with that said, I am so very appreciative um, for your presence here today, Administrator Brooks LaShore. Thank you so very much for coming through and telling us about what the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are doing. There was a question in the chat with respect to the extended role of Medicare. What I do encourage you to do is. Um, be in touch with uh, with the CMS to uplift your questions. If if it's helpful, um, and Mr. Brooks LaShore, we will send those questions to your office um, on the back end. And then, of course, Congresswoman Robin Kelly, my 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 boss, my forever boss. And um, and then I'm I'm also just going to put a plug. Just as someone who is a new mother and um, someone who's worked with Miss Kelly for so long. Um, in, in multiple capacities. I, I couldn't be more uh, honored to be a part of, of your work. And thank you so very much for your support, not just in this role, but in this role as I'm evolving as a, as a, as a mother to a young boy and, um, and even with my office so that I can pump and such like that. So uh, thank you both. I hope that you all will stay on board. We have a, a continuing conversation um, with, with some ladies who are um, either co-founders or advisory board members to the Black Women's Congressional Alliance. They've worked on the Hill for married years, as well as on maternal health policy and other policies that support the health of, of women, um, Black, Brown, or other on, um, throughout the nation. And, and all, the, all of them have either had a child or are currently going through that process. So I'm going to invite them onto the screen and uh, say thank you once again to Congresswoman Kelly and thank you once again to, uh, to Administrator Brooks LaShore. So we are going to pivot, and um, in this part of the conversation, we're we're gonna we're gonna get a, a down to the nitty gritty and and say words that you know maybe titty will pop out of our mouths or something like that or some other words like uh, you know, but we're gonna get real with it. So today we have join, joining us um, some really phenomenal people. We have Christina Henderson, who's at large member of the count of the Council of the District of Columbia. She's previously served as the legislative assistant for the United States Senate Democratic leader, Chuck Schumacher, uh, Schumer, I'm giving him all kinds of names today. Um, he, she's also served as the committee director for uh, DC's Committee on Education and in the offices of previous Senator Hillary Clinton, as well as for uh, Kay Hagan. And uh, as I mentioned before, she's one of the co-founders of the Black Women's um, Congressional Alliance. Thank you very much for joining us today, Christina. And we also have with us Yasmin Rigney. She is the senior principal at Bracewell. Yasmin, where are you on my screen? Here you are, got it. You've, uh, she's, she's recently served as a senior policy advisor to, uh, to now Vice President Kamala Harris. And she was at, in, that, in that role responsible for managing the then Senator's economic agenda, as well as advising on other policies uplifted by the Congressional Tri-Caucus, um, as well as on the political side. She's also previously served on the Finance Committee 
and in Senator Cory Booker's office and is a co-founder as well of the BWCA. We also now have with us Keenan Austin. I'm gonna give Keenan Austin Reed her, an opportunity to introduce herself because I do want her to let us know why she thought it was so very important to bring the BWCA to this conversation. But before I turn it over to Keenan to tell us a bit about herself, I wanna talk about Lakeisha Steele. She is the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Department of Education's Office of Legislation in Congressional Affairs. And she previously served as a professional staff member on the House Education and Labor Committee for Chairman Bobby Scott, as well as an education policy advisor um, to um, Suzanne Bonamici, who's, uh, who's a Congresswoman from Oregon. And she is a co-founder of BWCA. The four of them are also fantastic mamas. And we're gonna talk about that too. But let me go ahead and, uh, and, and bring Keenan into the conversation. Hi there, Keenan. Mia, thank you um, for just being a fantastic and awesome chief of staff, human being, and new mom. That's so proud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Black Women's Congressional Alliance is over 300 Black women on Capitol Hill, um, both House and Senate. We're bipartisan, um, and all these ladies have are uh, representative of that network. When we talk about Black maternal health and the work, Mia, that you, you've you done and your boss has done and Administrator Brooks LaSure has done, it is personal. We are, most of us are of childbearing age and we are grappling with, are we going to be listened to? Who, who are the best health care providers? Um, making a birth plan. Uh, we've got family members who are concerned about the coverage gaps. And so we are experiencing the policy, but also writing the policy at the same time. So, um, and we try to stand in the gaps. Uh, many of our memberships are, um, members are the only one in their office. They are the voice of Black women um, in their space. And so while they're, you know, dealing with their own issues and fears and concerns, they are um, trying to make policy to make it better for everyone. When Black women are at the table, we bring equity to the table. And so I'm just grateful to you, Mia. I'm grateful to Congresswoman Kelly for her advocacy for allowing the Black Women's Congressional Alliance to be a part of this conversation and just look forward to discussing more. Thank you. But you said it, Keenan. I mean, the work that you all are doing and, and the, the spirit in which BWCA was founded is to wrap arms around around women, uh, young women in Congress, right? Who are who are black and brown. And um, I think that that's, that's a part of, that's a huge part of this conversation be, because we're also talking about, we have to acknowledge that the space of Congress is a space of privilege. We don't all necessarily come from privilege, but it is an affluential, influential space. And that matters when we're talking about maternal health because it's not, maternal health of black and brown women is not something that is dependent on on other health out, uh, health related issues that have to do with socioeconomic status or achievement, you can't achieve your way out of being um, at risk of higher higher mortality and morbidity rates. So I want to bring in um, all of you and, and talk a little bit about you know your experience, how you came into the conversation of maternal health and specifically mortality and morbidity in your capacity in Congress. And what was your experience like working on the issue? Or what is your experience like working on the issue? And Christina, I, I'll ask you to chime in first. Um, thanks, Mia. And, and thanks again to Congresswoman Kelly for having us um, on. This is really exciting uh, to be on a panel with these ladies. Um, so I have two daughters. Uh, Jordan, who is three, and Cameron, who is seven months, um, and very spunky. And um, I would say that, you know, I think working on Capitol Hill, the issue and the drumbeat around the crisis that was happening around Black maternal health had already been pounding, if you will. Um, we knew the statistics, um, but again, you know, that moment when you become pregnant yourself, the statistics become even more personal because you yourself don't want to become a statistic. And so you are really trying to figure out um, not only how to protect yourself, but how to support or enable policies going forward to protect your sisters around you. Because um, I think we've all know someone who has had a scare or some type of complication that could have gone wrong. And even for some of us, we have had, um, you know, colleagues or associates or friends that we know um, who, you know, passed away after childbirth or complications thereof. And so I think, um, you know, I think, Mia, you said it just right, it, it becomes very personal. And even when I transitioned off the Hill, 
<clears throat> and you know, being elected um, in in DC government, the very first bill I introduced in DC government when I was elected was on maternal health, Maternal Health Access and Resources Act. Um, that bill passed. It was around getting Medicaid coverage for doulas um, and also requiring transportation um, services to help women get to and from their appointments. Because in the district, we have the highest maternal mortality rate in the country, a rate that's double the national average, um, and it was just poor statistics all around um, in terms of half of black women in the district um, did not seek prenatal care until their second and third trimester, which definitely impacted the outcomes that were happening later on. And so um, I always keep at the forefront of my, my mind, my own experiences, but also um, how can I make sure that we're essentially protecting our sisters going forward as well. Christina, thank you very much for, for your work on, in, in local government. And I, I do want to acknowledge that there had been a question earlier about um, how, how people can be involved in the maternal health conversation on a local level. So um, feel free, please, to answer that question either in the chat or, or bring it up in, in your next remarks, because we want to acknowledge that. And by the way, speaking of not acknowledging, a lot of you on, um, in the virtual world are telling us your stories in the chat. Thank you so much for that. Please keep it coming. This is a safe space virtually or, or what have you. Um, and we want to acknowledge that we see what you're saying. We feel your pain. We hope that you and your families are healing. And we want to uplift life for you at, at all times. Yasmin, I want to bring you into the conversation. Same question. How did you come to the maternal health conversation? And what was that experience like for you? Well, well thank you so much. I'm, I am so honored to be on this panel right now. Um, I wanted just make sure I said this clearly. Um, you know, I started my career with uh, Senator Booker, who I think is a phenomenal, um, passionate leader for, uh, you know, uh, women, maternal health, uh, Black women in particular, right? Um, and from there, I got this this passion to do things um, in policy on the Senate side that I don't, I don't necessarily know was ingrained in us to be able to do. Um, and so working under, you know, um, Black women in his office was such an empowerment and a an powerful role that um, it allowed me to then start to think about where we were missing pieces uh, uh, in the Senate, right? Uh, so I went to work on Senate, Senate finance and started to ask questions about um, different tax codes and different um, uh, healthcare pieces that just to me did not seem equitable at all. Um, and I was, I was faced with a lot of pushback. People would tell me that um, the administration, the tax code was very black and white. And it was so interesting that they used that kind of, um, of vernacular to explain something like this because it is black and white. It's so black and white that it's so unequitable, right? Um, and so it, 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 when I was offered the opportunity to go and work for one of um, the only Black women uh, to, to work in the Senate as a senator, uh, then Senator Kamala Harris, I knew it was my job to make, to make sure to answer those questions, right? So why does it feel like we are, we are treated inequitably? Um, why does it feel like I'm not being heard at work, right? Um, then Senator Kamala Harris empowered me. She gave me the ability to ask those questions and then answer them, right? And so there was only two Black staffers uh, at the time uh, who led her policy issues. And we worked very closely together on health, on education, and on economics to make sure that the, the packages of uh, proposals that we put together for her um, and offered to her to, to introduce were, were, were very black and white, right? Um, we wanted to make sure that um, we, we answered those questions and we introduced the Maternal Care Act, we introduced um, the LIFT Act, we introduced a number of different bills uh, to make sure that we could, you know, further those, those conversations. And, um, you know, it was, it was through members of Congress, right? Like Brett Kelly, like, um, who continued that passion, that, that fight uh, on the House side and did not let, you know, um, outside world kind of let you think that we weren't being heard. Uh, we partnered with uh, many celebrities. Uh, Serena, Serena Williams was one of the, one of the partners. And, and you know, we, we think that through 
all of these kind of coalitions, the collaborative efforts of um, you know our black members on Congress that we were able to kind of put this um, topic at the forefront. Uh, whereas now we have you know VP Kamala Harris leading the charge uh, in in, uh, in the White House. So, you know, it, was, it was such a very honorable position for me to be in to just contribute in the very small way that I was. And then you know uh, at the end of. Uh, I found out I was pregnant and it became even more of a passionate issue for me. Um, suffering through, you know, uh, loss. I had loss of my own. I suffered um, uh, miscarriages in the past. So it became very important for me to not only um, ensure that the health of myself and the health of my, you know, children uh, were at the of the conversation, you know, in 2019 and 2020, I was I was developing policy and legislation uh, while on maternity leave, and it was just um, one of the you know forefront experiences that I've ever had, and I'm, I'm eternally grateful. I think Yasmin, what you're getting at is the fact that sometimes it takes having the experience to bring the conversation to the table of of power, and it, it shouldn't be the case, um, but we're doing the work. Lakeisha, same question. How did you come into the space of maternal health policy and, and what's been your experience so far? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, um, and thank you so much to um, Congresswoman Kelly, who is my home state uh, congresswoman. So um, so shout out to, to King Key. And it's, um, it's honestly just so, it, it, why I'm here is just so deeply personal. Uh, my experience um, coming into understanding black maternal mortality is being around it, being, uh, being in the house when these conversations were happening, when Congresswoman Kelly and Congresswoman Underwood, you know, was leading, you know, this great work, um, being a part of the Black Women's Congressional Alliance and hearing my, my fellow BWCA sisters like Christina and Yasmin, you know, share, you know, their, their experiences with, um, with not being a statistic, with having to navigate, um, you know, a healthcare system, you know, that is, that has been failing Black women. And then now being three months postpartum and having a near death experience um, myself, um, you know, it, it is, it, it should not be in the year of 2022, where the most dangerous thing a Black woman can do is to become pregnant. Um, and so my entire pregnancy um, was marred by and was marred with anxiety of not wanting to die, of having to ask specific questions at my prenatal visit. So the first question I asked when I found out I was pregnant um, was how familiar they were with black maternal mortality and what ha and what were they doing in their practice specifically to protect the lives of black women. And I purposely stayed with my OB who trained in Baltimore. And so I actually live in Upper Marlboro, Maryland now, but I was traveling for my prenatal visits, you know, two hours, two and a half hours um, to Nova, to Fairfax, because the practice had shown me that they were so dedicated to this issue and had stayed on top of the latest research and, and, and specific data when, when, it, when it comes to um, protecting, you know, the lives of Black women. You know, there were specific questions I asked when it came to preeclampsia, and I come and I came to find out that it. You can ask all the questions. You can navigate the system. You can be prepared. Mia, you said it best that you can't, um, you 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 can't, um, you know, achieve out of you know, and, and also knowing the, the 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 latest research, you know, on these issues. You know, it is, it's really about being your own advocate, even if you don't have a doula, doula making sure that you have, uh, you know, the right questions to ask at your, you know, when you're going towards, you know, when you're there for your uh, prenatal visits, but when it comes to your postpartum care, I think that there is, there has to be great care that we take, not just on the prenatal side, but on the postpartum side. Even at, once, once I got to six weeks postpartum, after having an emergency C-section, you know, I was worried about dying. When I got to eight weeks, even now being now 13 weeks postpartum, those are all things that I think about. And here I am equipped with, you know, um, a degree, you know, a master's degree with access to information, with access to be on panels like this. And I still, you know, fear and have that trepidation every single day. So I think about all of the low-income black women 
who are having to face this without having access to the information and the knowledge, you know, and the resources. And I think it's just really time that we really get serious about saving, you know, and protecting, you know, the lives of Black women. You know, um, so I'm going to, to loop some of the things you said, Lakeisha, and some of the things you started to say, Keenan. Um, and then I'll also acknowledge that when we're talking about fear, and I don't want us to end on the conversation of fear, but I want to make sure that we're giving the, giving the space because it's so true. Um, for me, when I, was, when I was having my son, and similarly, Lakeisha, in terms of what, what every encounter felt like, it was more like, I'm asking this question, question because I do not want to fill in the blank, right? Um, maybe the fear is something you felt in your head in terms of headaches or um, for me, it was something I felt, be, I wasn't breathing, a lot. like I felt myself holding my breath a lot when I was listening to um, my providers as they were explaining things to me, either pre-birth or, or during the labor. Um, you know, the fear can manifest in so many ways. Keenan, when you're, when you're with friends and colleagues who are Black women and they're talking about, or, or even if you're talking about having children, either soon or in the, in the near future, what are some things that are consistently coming up in your conversations in terms of what they may be fearful of? And then I'm hoping you can answer the same question in terms of what they hope for. Yeah, Mia, that's a great question. Um, I was, I was, I've neglected to mention that I'm uh, on a daily group chat with these ladies, um, and that's really how I get my Black maternal health uh, education. And <laughs> it has been so insightful. Um, but when we think about like the, the fear and, and how we kind of, you know, come to this conversation, it's, it's about like, it's something Lakeisha touched on. It's like, she's got these degrees. She works in Congress. She can be on a panel with Robin Kelly, but you can't really like achieve your way out of it. One of the things that has been so, um, interesting to me about this crisis is it doesn't matter how much access you have or how much capital you have. You, Serena, like, uh, I think it was Yasmin who was talking about her work with Serena Williams. Serena Williams is like the, the goat, right? And she wasn't believed. Um, and so the systemic bias is, is what I worry about. As a professional, I'm, I'm cheering for you and, and hope to work alongside you. I'm so excited about uh, the Maternal Health Im uh, Quality Improvement Act that you, had, that you and your boss had a chance to work on. I'm hoping we cl close the coverage gap um, I think that's some of the joy, right? It's that we are finally, and it goes back also to the work of BWCA. We're, we're trying to get more Black women in the room, more Black women on Capitol Hill, more Black women actually working on the policy. The reason why that's so incredibly important is would we be talking about these issues? Will we have a Black Maternal Health Week? Will we have a bill that the president just signed into law? Will we be calling for this in the Health Equity Act, the Build Back Better Act? had, you know, we not had Black women leaders who found this to be important and raising it every conversation possible. So that's a, that's a little bit about what I'm thinking, Mia, and thanks for bearing with the noise. That is so strong right there, Keenan. And, and with that, I would be um, remiss if I didn't give a shout out to the, the staffers who are working on, on this work right now. In fact, in, on our own health team, our senior health policy advisor, Dr. Dr. Anita Vertigo, shout out to Anita, Anita. in the chat somewhere. Um, yeah. And then also shout out to our accomplices who are staff who are not black and brown women, right? Who understand like, oh, I hear you. I may not feel precisely what you're feeling, but we're gonna do this work together, right? So shout out also to Rachel Kingery, our, our comms director, who was adamant that we have this program and, and people yes. like her, right? Who, who bring this conversation. She's been great. You know? Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, let, let me just ahead. say uh, one point on that mm -hmm. is um, we also have to shout out um, these organizations, these grassroots organizations that have been screaming this at the top of their lungs for years, right? I mean, without them, we literally would not even have the confidence, I think. I mean, as far as myself, I don't know if I would have had the confidence to be like, wait, we actually have to talk about this. Like, we can do something about this. You know, we have these organizations that are out of cities that just know, uh, you know, they have this connection to the city and state. And um, it's just important for us to also shout them out. So I want to say Mothering Justice, 
who is a, a grassroots organization out of Detroit, want to say thank you guys for the work that you guys have been doing for years. Um, and, and now just kind of seeing the light of some of the work that you've been doing. Um, there are a number of other organizations we can kind of go down a list, but, but definitely just need to make sure that the, the black moms who don't have the pin, but also, but have the, like the, the speaker, uh, box and kind of, um, shouting from the rooftops, they need to be heard too here for sure. I know that's right. Yes, you all are, are getting your flowers today. So make sure you stay around Black women because we're going to uplift you because we need you to continuously uplift us for sure. What would you all say to, um, to in, in addition to what you've mentioned, Keenan, what would you say to Black women who are, who are presently on this call, who are sliding into the chat DMs, um, who might have fears about being impacted by this crisis? What, what, what words would you give them? Go ahead, Christina. Um, I mean, I think the first thing I would say is your fear is valid. So don't let anybody say you are over exaggerating or all those different types of things because it happens each and every day. Right. And so if you feel like your provider to Lakeisha's point, like if you feel like your provider is not listening to you, it's okay. You can change providers. That is the agency that you have. And I feel like in some, in these conversations, I think we have to explain to black women, number one, you can ask questions. Number two, you can like say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to switch doctors. I'm going to go to some place, someplace else. Um, and then number three, it's okay to speak up in the room and, and own your um, agency and space in this. The other thing that I would say is that um, women in, in our roles are not just working on it from the maternal health standpoint, so the, the, the prenatal piece of it, but we're also very much working on the policy pieces to help support you on the back end. Um, one of the things I was really excited to work on when I um, worked for Senator Schumer was uh, paid parental leave for all federal employees, 12 weeks of paid parental leave. And we fought <laughs> uh, with our colleagues on the other side of the aisle and people are like, well, why, you know, is this so important? And all these things, and I'm like, if you've ever been through a major surgery, like a C-section is a major surgery, period. Childbirth is major, period. The idea that some woman can just get up in three or four weeks later and go back to doing their everyday work. This is how we have some of the postpartum crises that we have around black maternal health. And so if we are going to take care of the health, it can't just be on the prenatal side. We have to put policies in place to protect it on the postnatal uh, and, and excuse me, in the postpartum periods as well. So paid family leave, we're working on the childcare front because, you know, nobody talks about that part. Nobody talks about it. No, no nobody <laughs> talks about how expensive that part is. But so I see all that today, your fear is valid, but also know that there are lots of people who are working to support all the various pieces that encompasses because I, you know, having two children, now I know more than ever, right? Like you are meant to have a village period that you are meant to have a village to help you raise a child. And so I, I am passionate about this work because it's, it's about women and children. I don't know, I haven't met, but who, who desire for their children and for themselves to be able to continue on this path, to build their family and have opportunity for success without fear of, of, of dying or sickness or hurt. Um, and so I'm grateful for all of the staffers who come to this work, sort of thinking about it from those very angles is, is it's not just around who the doctor is giving birth, but what else are we going to do once the child gets here to not only, um, protect them, but also to protect the mothers and ensure that they're able to heal, um, and able to be the very best that they can be and show up each and every day. And Yasmin was talking about that, Christina, when she said earlier, you know, looking at tax codes and looking at economic related, essentially you're talking about an intersectional approach to protecting the, the you know, and, and, and socially supporting and psychologically supporting the existence of black and brown women, right? That's that's what it comes down to. to your absolutely. Point. You can't we can talk about the maternal health or the mental health piece of it too. Oh but. my gosh, absolutely. We can have a whole other, Rachel, let's have a whole nother panel just on that, please. Let us please do that. You know, um, to your point about policies, and I'm so glad someone actually said this in the chat. We are on the same virtual wavelength, whoever said this in the chat. We're talking about policies to support black and brown women who have either given birth or who are preparing to give birth. We have to talk about reimbursement rates and equitable reimbursement rates for, for providers, especially if you're seeing 
um, women who are on Medicaid um, or who are, are, are outside of the, the, um, the healthcare uh, marketplace and, and need of care. We have, we have to be able to talk about that because otherwise it becomes a quality of care issue. It becomes a, well, I'm not going to see this type of patient because the reimbursement rates are too low and I have, you know, that kind of thing. But the other thing too that we do have to talk about is that, you know, we, we've got to operate in the policy space but policies can't legislate hearts and minds. You can't legislate uh, someone looking at a black woman and not seeing um, a, a stereotypical story in that black woman, woman, right? I can't, if, if I were saying, if I were a, you know, a, a member of Congress, I can't write a law that says white men, um, you must look at black women with love in your eyes, right? That's not going to happen. Um, but to your point, Keenan's earlier point about getting people to the table who um, understand and or who at least are willing to understand or at least are willing to build relationships with people who better understand what the issues are um, and become neighborly in that way, become people who are um, supportive and wanting to learn about why this issue matters. That's what we also need to, that's certainly where we need to be. Um, I think about relationships as a site of, um, of, of healing Black women and relationships between you know, people who are not just black women. Um, so some other policies that might support that to Christina, your other point is, you know, looking at um, housing loans and uh, mortgage loans and availability of those. And um, because if we can start there, the conversation could potentially then verge into desegregating neighborhoods and if by, by class and by race. And if we have a bit more of that, um, then we will potentially have people who are neighbors who are very different in terms of their race and ethnicity, and you can build relationships there. But I mean, that might sound simple, but when we look at across generations of wellness and wealth building and, and just overall health, we've got to talk about um, all of those other things that, Christina, you pointed out, don't necessarily on the face of it look like maternal health policy, but they support the wellness of Black and Brown people and, the, and families, um, and certainly women. Uh, so to your point, please. Mm -hmm. just to your point there, right, PG County, and I'm just speaking because I live in Upper Marlboro, um, around the corner from Lakeisha, um, and uh, we, we've we noticed that PG County is one of the, you know, um, blackest counties, right, that has the most uh, black wealth uh, in America, actually. And here, you can actually find more black doctors, more black women doctors, more black nurses than you can in most areas of the country, right? But it was still very difficult for myself, and I'm, I'm not gonna speak for anyone else, but, but I, at least for myself to find a doctor that I felt answered my questions that didn't think, make me feel like, you know, I, it was all in my head. You know, there, I had one doctor who was like, listen, that's all, that's, that's all, you know, talk. That's all talk. And I said, oh, okay won't come back here. Like, it's time to, it's time to go somewhere else, you know? It, and, and, and like Christina made that point earlier, it is your, your responsibility, it's your agency to go ahead and, and say, listen, I want to be heard. I'm going to go to someone who's going to, to listen to me. Now, I know for myself, I was working on Capitol Hill and, um, you know, I, I did not necessarily um, find a doula in time for my cesarean section. I was looking for it and then, uh, you know, uh, blood pressure shot up. And then next thing you know, I was having my son. And so um, the, one other piece of advice I would give to folks is look for your doula early so that you have her throughout the, you know, the, the end of at least your second trimester towards your third, um, because things can happen really quickly. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of doulas in DC that um, will we'll work with you to find, you know, the, the right um, uh, amount. I've, I've had friends who have come out of the woodworks at this point um, since I said I had a, a C-section. Uh, and so just, you know, I know that there, in the chat, there, there are um, uh, conversations happening. Um, reach out to folks, have conversations. I've, I've had so much uh, guidance from my friends here in these group chats. I, I would encourage you and, you know, get a group chat going. Um, BWCA has been such a home for me, and um, these ladies have, have felt like, you know, um, sisters because of it, right? Um, and, and so I encourage you to do the same. And with that, I'm going, I'm going to bounce it back to you, girl. I know I'm, I'm going off script. <laughs> 
No, I'm so glad you did. I was about to say, I'm trying to crash this group chat, but go ahead, Lakeisha, you were about to say something. <laughs> Oh, no, I just wanted to say, Mia, I think that your boss, in terms of her next steps, when she mentioned the mandatory um, postpartum care and Medicaid, I think is a game changer. I think for those, uh, you know, Black women, um, you know, with, with private insurance, one of the things that I did was be very intentional with talking to my OB when she explained, you know, uh, my appointments would be six weeks and eight weeks. And I was like, no, I will be checking in with you at two weeks. And then I'm going to be checking in with you, you know, at four weeks. Um, and I, I, I think you know, if you, it, it, it's okay to tell yourself, to, to listen to your gut. I think Black women have some of the most keen instincts on the planet. And when we know that something is not right, you know that something is not right. And you, and you have to be your best advocate. So when you are in a health practice, and if you are uncomfortable at any point, it is time to go, even if that means inconveniencing yourself when it comes to your travel and maybe your doctor is it next to you know your your doctor maybe your doctor's not next to your your office um, maybe you have to travel an hour but your but our lives are worth it that is what we have to tell ourselves that our lives are worth it and I think that when you are not listened to I think we have to make people listen to us because it, it, again it, it should not be that the most dangerous thing that we do in 22 in 22 is black women is 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 actually become pregnant. Um, and actually have to, you know, deal with, you know, um, navigating a, a healthcare system and racial disparities, you know, on the postpartum, on the postpartum side as well as prenatal. But I'm so grateful for all of these women, and all the great work that you all are doing, um, and and how you're being intentional on ending this on a positive note, um, because we can, you know, take back, you know, um, this issue, and we absolutely um, have members like your boss you know, who are working, you know, every day to ensure the, that our voices are heard um, and that our lives are valued and, and protected. I love it. Any any last words before we, we close out? And thank you all for rocking with us in the second part of this uh, this chat. I'm hoping we can get a part two, but I want to give everybody 30 seconds to, to, to close this out. Keenan, let's start with you. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Congresswoman, for hosting this. And thank you, team. I work with the entire Robin Kelly team. So I would not, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Ms. Rachel and Ms. Ani and Dr. Burgos um, for being great folks. Um, everybody hit it, but I, I would just drill down on get the playbook before you go to the doctor's appointment. You're not the first woman to go through this. Some sister can give you the readout and who and what to avoid. So roll with that. But thank you again for this conversation. Thanks, Keenan. Yes, go ahead. Yasmin, after you. Sorry, I was reading the group chat. It is really popping in that group chat. I love it. I wish I could like follow us and answer all of the questions. Um, you know, I'm I'm just really fortunate. I I feel very extremely blessed to be uh, able to to have this conversation with you guys. So thank you so much for um for 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 allowing me to participate, allowing me to give my experience. Um, it's it's been a good almost decade. Well, it was a good almost decade on the Hill. And I think, you know, BWCA is, is birthing BWCA, uh, excuse me, I did not birth it, but, but Keenan and, and others birthing it, Christina uh, birthing it and, and allowing us to kind of care for this baby has been such a privilege. Um, and, and I'm so honored to be a part of it. Uh, if you guys have any questions or concern about uh, Maryland or DC kind of um, birthing experiences, um, I've gone through a bit, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to help. Uh, and with that, I will just, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Yasmin. Lakeisha. Just wanna again, just express my gratitude to you, Mia and your boss, um, and also to the Black Women's Congressional Alliance. Um, Obviously, I know that I'm biased, but you know, to to be a part of such an organization that really does walk the talk, that really does believe in taking our roles very seriously, whether the in the administration or in Congress, um, or on K Street or in on DC City Council, um, taking very seriously um, our agency when it comes to the business of Black women, 
And this is an issue that BWCA um, cares deeply about. You all can see that this has all affected us, you know, personally. Um, and as staffers, um, it has been an issue that that we that we all have um, that that my colleagues here have and my sisters have worked on. And so I think that if you if you have questions, if you're if you um, are even a black woman right now that's interested in becoming pregnant, you're pregnant, um, and you uh, want to talk to us um, and. You know we're happy. Uh, you know we're happy to do so. Um, if you um, like, yes said. If you if you need um, if you have questions about being connected to doulas, you know whether it's in the district or in Maryland or in Virginia, um, we certainly are happy to share. You know our, our personal experiences um, with you. Thanks, Akisha. Christina. Um, yeah, I, I, the thing I want to underscore is that you know and you center Black women and you take care of it on this front, everyone benefits, right? It's not just Black women who will benefit from these changes in policy. It's everyone who would benefit from these changes in policies. And so I want to extend um, my gratitude to Representative Kelly, uh, Congresswoman Underwood, and all, everyone who's been working um, on the Black maternal health issue in, in the Congress. I would also say to folks who are interested in this issue, right, sometimes, you know, uh, Congress can be uh, deliberative, in pace. Um, and so your, your state and local governments also have the opportunity to layer on some policies here um, to, to move ahead and to advance. And so if you're in the District of Columbia, that's definitely something that we're doing here. I'm really excited. Um, we're about to do a maternal mental health task force here in DC. Um, that we're hopefully going to get funded at the end of this week. Um, so there's just a lot of stuff that's going on. The other thing I would say too, you know, BWCA has been great it, it, in sort of the Black women space and the Black mama space. There are other organizations that are there for support too. I have to shout out my girls at District Motherhood, um, which is also around, you know, supporting both pregnant women, but also those who have given birth as well. Like I said, I feel like um, you know, that, that, that proverb or that saying that it takes a village to raise a child is like so deeply important. And so I feel like for women, you, you're not alone in this uh, and you shouldn't have to travel this journey alone in silence. So connect with us and we're good. Really appreciate you all coming through. Christina Henderson, Lakeisha Steele, Yasmin Nelson. And then we have, I think, Keenan just went off camera, but she's but we we uh, still uplift her um, in her absence. Keenan Austin Reed, thank you all to our audience. Thank you so much to Congresswoman staff for putting this together. Rachel, I know you're in the virtual world. There's calls for a part two, so uh, hopefully that will come through. Um, ladies, take care of yourselves. Continue to call on your on your um, on your village to to help you take care of yourselves and your families. I'm going to pump and then go pick up my munchkin. And I'm going to catch you all another time. Playdates in the future. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.